Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first session of tonight's PEO 2020 Council Election All Candidates Meeting. My name is Arthur Sinclair, and I will be the moderator for tonight's discussion. Tonight, we will hear from the candidates for president elect. The three candidates for this position are Royden Fraser, Darla Campbell, and Marilyn Spink. The electronic meeting with the candidates via webcast enables voters to learn about the candidates and PEO issues, so more of them will vote. Voters were able to post questions online in advance of the discussion. We'll try to get as many of those as possible. In accordance with the approved protocol for the all candidates meeting, I as moderator may shorten the questions and not read out preambles to questions, may select any question, may remove offensive and duplicate questions, and may ask questions not on the platform. Each candidate will provide three minutes for opening remarks. I will then direct the questions to a candidate. That candidate will have one minute to respond to the questions. After the candidate has responded, the other two remaining candidates will have one minute to address the first candidate's response to the question. Following the question period, the candidates will have two minutes each for closing remarks. The order of speakers was determined by a draw earlier this evening. The views and opinions expressed on this broadcast do not necessarily reflect the views of the PO and are the responsibility of the candidates. So, without further delay, let's get started with opening remarks. The first candidate for president elect, Ryden Fraser. Welcome. First, I must thank all members who are watching and who are going to participate in the PO elections. You are the heart and soul of PO and our self-regulation. I see daily the future potential of engineering through my teaching of students in many disciplines, through my research into connected vehicles, autonomous connected vehicles, machine learning, quantum computing, and through startups that my students create. Unfortunately, PO is on a path to irrelevance when you see what my students are interested in. As new knowledge and new disciplines emerge, there's a stark choice in leadership to be had in this election. Over the past few years, PO Council has engaged in governance changes that neuter self-regulation, decrease transparency, and set PO on a hastened path towards irrelevance. Anyone who knows well my time on council knows I never stopped my strong plea that council stop all governance activities for at least one year and instead start tackling the big issues facing the profession. For example, offshore design, licensing that's supportive of entrepreneurship, whistleblower protection, emerging disciplines and engaging them, increasing the public image for the profession, etc. Unfortunately, the leadership for such was just never there. So none of these big issues ever made it into council's yearly priorities. As president, I will lead council's work to champion the future of engineering. I am motivated by a strong desire to enhance the engineering profession, to make PNG relevant to the public in emerging disciplines, to have members respect it and defend self-regulation, and to ensure a fair admissions process, and to battle for a return to member-inclusive peer review. And I will stand up for chapters having been a past chapter exec and chair myself. Thank you. The second candidate for president-elect is Darla Campbell. Good evening. It's a privilege to speak with you today at the PEO 2022 All Candidates Meeting, made possible through the modern technology of Zoom. 20 years ago, I was invited by the Canadian Consulate to be a keynote speaker in Nagoya, Japan. 
Speaking through a translator, I shared the experience of how Canadian businesswomen were making significant strides, and that was connected to the recommendations by the Royal Commission on the Status of Women. I've been working for equity for a long time, and I am passionate to support Engineers Canada 30 by 30 campaign, and the need for PEO to be uh, to value inclusivity and diversity, not only for women, but for all. During the campaign in 2017, I set a goal to visit at least half the chapters during the campaign. That goal was achieved. I cherish the stories that I heard from you about your passion for engineering, the many firsts that you had, have achieved, and your commitment to mentor others. You inspire me. Why vote for me? With your vote, I will bring my experience to elevate the engineering profession in Ontario and take action to make PEO a relevant regulator. This campaign is about leadership, vision, and results. Leadership. PEO needs a leader with a proven record of accomplishments, leading boards, organizations, people, and projects. Vision. What direction is PEO moving in? Is it the right direction to protect the public interest today and in the future? PEO needs a leader who will champion an engagement initiative that gathers your ideas, suggestions, and opportunities to make PEO a relevant regulator. And results, provide a clear direction for PEO by developing a robust strategic plan that puts PEO on a path to relevancy, incorporating the input from the engagement initiative. PEO needs a leader who gets results within the three-year term of office and sets PEO up for success going forward. I offer you as that leader. My key priorities include enhancing standards and practice guidelines, accelerating and modernizing the licensing process, embracing chapters as a model of communities of support, advocating where the public interest is at risk, operating in a global world, regulate locally, function globally. I chose engineering because it offered the opportunity to become part of a profession. After 29 years of licensure in PEO, I continue to wear the PNG designation with pride. I'm running in this election to elevate the engineering profession in Ontario for you, for me, for future generations, and for the protection of the public and the environment. I look forward to the questions and our future conversations as we build the future together. The third candidate for president-elect is Marilyn Spink. Thank you uh, for this opportunity. And I just want to thank Art for volunteering his time to moderate and to Royden and Darla actually for putting their names forward in the hat uh, to run as president-elect. And I wish you the best luck. Uh, my name is Marilyn Spink and I've been licensed with PEO since uh, 1995. I am a practicing engineer with over 25 years of experience currently in an engineering leadership role at a global engineering firm called Asenco. I bring a depth and breadth of engineering expertise from leading multidiscipline engineering design teams delivering complex international projects valued from US dollar 500 million to $9 billion. For six years, I sat on PEO council as Lieutenant Governor appointee, uh, and I am currently your elected vice president. With your continued support, I will hit the ground running as your president-elect, as I deeply understand Council's role to effectively govern our profession. From my time spent on Council and my volunteer time contributing to PEO's Complaints Committee, Audit and Finance Committee, Executive Committee, and Human Resource Committee. I also have chaired and participated in several of PEO's task forces and working groups, including being chosen as vice president appointed by my council peers in 2017. Additionally, I bring solid governance and chairing experience to PEO council from my past directorships on several corporate boards and from my current board role with Avalon Advanced Materials, a Canadian company focused on materials for use in clean energy and new technologies. I am an avid supporter of PEO's change vision. Council has done a lot of work to get us where we are today. PEO aspires to become a professional modern regulator that delivers on its statutory mandate and is supported by a governance culture that consistently makes decisions that serve and protect the public interest. I am convinced a strong engineering regulator will equal a strong engineering profession. 
So I'm asking for your vote as PEO's president-elect to realize PEO's change vision. So one, our profession can progress the critical work needed for transformational change. And two, our profession remains relevant. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes the opening remarks. Now, let's go to some of the questions. To get us started off, talk a little bit about yourselves. So as someone seeking a leadership position on council, what do you think makes you a good leader? And that first question goes to Raiden. Excuse me, Raiden. Okay. Um, thank you very much. In terms of uh, what would make me a good leader, I'd just like to uh, take a look at my experience. I have much experience on PO Council. Uh, it goes back over 20 years. And before that, it goes back to the chapters. In terms of the resume perspective, I have been directly involved in several governance uh, models at PO over my 30 years, and I've seen them all work and fail. From an accomplishment perspective, I would like to credit uh, the success of my students. I have many students have been successful in setting up companies. And from a PO perspective, I'm offering my leadership as choice for change, for focusing on the big problems. Thank you. Thank you. And Darla, your response, what makes you a good leader? Right, what makes me a good leader? I'm an inclusive leader, a good listener, and I can ask good questions. Um, important, uh, including goal setting, teamwork, communication, and perseverance. Um, I've spoken at many conferences um, and I've given opening remarks at various events. Um, in my role of PEO Vice President during that term, I attended more than 30 Zoom meetings, very uh, coordinated uh, in this technology. Um, and I have spoken in at many events, um, connected uh, uh, projects. Uh, I've chaired many AGMs, um, some quite confront confrontational, um, been able to stay focused, uh, be able to um, focus on the outcome, and to um, do that in a way that is respectful um, of those around us. Thank you. And the last response goes to Marilyn. Hi. Uh, um, so what do I think, you know, if I, what makes me a good leader? Well, I have the ability to influence and build consensus. Um, with respect to Professional Engineers Ontario and the council, I understand how council works. And it is council that makes this decision. It's not just one person. And I don't think people actually realize the president typically doesn't vote. I am collaborative and I do not set, I'm not so set in my ideas or opinions that if someone presents sort of a compelling argument based on evidence, I can and will be humble enough to change my mind. I was recently honored uh, to be selected as one of the top 100 global women in mining leaders um, by the Women in Mining UK. Um, so people see me as a leader, and I think it's very important that others see you as a leader and not necessarily what you see, how you see yourself. Thank you. And the next question goes to Marilyn. Uh, what do you add? Sorry, Art, excuse you uh, you froze up. <laughs> oh, excuse me. So um, what I'll just uh, I'll just abbreviate. What do you see as the role of council, and in particular, the role of the president and chair? Um. So let me just. How am I doing here? Just let me see how I'm doing here. I have my question. Um, so the role of council, as far as I'm concerned, is to set the direction and oversee um, PEO as an organization. But they only oversee one employee, which is their CEO and registrar. Um, and we have to use some key performance indicators or KPIs as people call it. 
um, and are we set direction and oversee. We don't get in the weeds. We don't get our hands. We don't get into operations, but we hold our CEO accountable, our registrar and CEO accountable um, to, to get the outcomes and results that we need. Thank you. First response to Royden. What do you see as the role of counsel, in particular the president and chair? Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I, I, I see the primary role of the president is to impart a vision, impart a future direction to counsel, to provide a roadmap that everyone is willing to follow and is committed to. And so even when there are disagreements of how you may get there, everyone is seeing the same insight, so we end up there. I also see it as adding in the current climate of irrelevance uh, that PO is headed towards of adding relevance, trying to add value added ideas to everything. Everything needs to have value added included in the activities and things we do to build trust, to respect our members. That's all important at building the foundation to be able to move the profession forward and have the volunteer base needed to actually advance the profession and advance PO's regulatory role. Thank you. Thank you. And the next response to Darla. So the role of counsel is to is to direct and protect the organization, the PEO as an organization, as, a, as the regulator. Uh, it's important that counsel understands its uh, its responsibility in, in the direction and protection um, um, part and the control piece. Um, one of the ways that I like to think about it is to keep, to keep your nose in and keep your fingers out. So at being nosy and asking questions and understanding, but not actually doing. The president's role is, is at, is, uh, President and Chair's role is, is really to facilitate the uh, discussions at Council to uh, create a roadmap so that uh, decisions are happening in a, in a in sort of a logical uh, stream um, and to, to steward um, and steer the, uh, the organization. Um, I believe that the uh, President and Chair is also a spokesperson on behalf of PEO um, and that uh, it's, it's um, it, it, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. So, I'm going to transition a little bit shortly to a lot of the online questions, which anybody can see if they would like to. And there are a number of them that I've, um, there are a number of them that relate to self-regulation. And before we hit those ones, I was hoping we might be able to ask, I'd be able to ask the question of, in your own words, how would you define self-regulation? The first, the first question goes to Darla. So self-regulation is a privilege, and it is a privilege that we have uh, currently, that we currently hold here in Ontario. We have the ability to, to self-regulate. And what that means is that is that um, we are able to, um, to choose our leadership, um, who makes decisions on behalf of, of, of the, um, of the uh, license holders. Um, there is a significant role for, for um, um, PNGs to become active um, in setting standards and becoming uh, participating in the, in the um, activities of the regulator. Um, and that level of engagement is all part of self-regulation. Self Thank you. First response to Marilyn. Your own words, self-regulation. Hi, my own words. Um, I I think I agree with Darla. Is self regulation uh, is a privilege and it's not a right. Uh, I actually cherish self regulation. I I think who better to regulate the profession than the profession itself? But we also have to realize that the government appoints counselors to our board. Um, they're not all elected, and I think very few of our license holders actually understand that. Um, I think self regulation, in my mind, it's it's a little bit about uh, the self and self-regulation is actually understanding the purpose of the profession, clarity of PO's pur purpose as a regulator, but it's that we can make our own regulations um, that are law. Um, that, that to me is the self and self-regulation. So the profession can make its own regulations. And the next response to what Thank you. Uh, we'll have a lot of consensus here. Darla's quite right. Uh, licensure in the self-regulating profession is a privilege. In terms of 
the definition of self-regulation in the way that we have it operating in Canada or have historically uh, since 1922. So we essentially have the members as being a significant part of our organization, a large part of our volunteer base of our workforce is actually volunteers from our membership directly involved in the operations. There are other models of self-regulations that do not have that. Our um, legislative committees have members um, on them, such as ARC, ERC, the Academic and Experience Requirement Committees. The we here is not council. The we is all members, in my view, of self-regulation. And council is simply a representation of that with some oversight from our LGA members. Thank you. Thank you. And so I wanted to give the folks on the line who, there's more than one question that was with respect to self-regulation. And I, I wanted to give them their due. Um, they are making reference to the PEO's anti-racism and anti-discrimination report referred to as the Bridge to PEO More Successful Future, which is available on the PEO website. There's also references to the Caton Report or the External Regulatory Performance Review, also available on the PEO website. And there's reference to the Fairness Commissioner, uh, which is the Fair Access, which the Fairness Commissioner was created as part of the Fair Access to Regulated Professions and Compulsory Trades Act of 2006. So I wanted, those are all available online. Mm -hmm. How do you think risks from outside reviews affect PL? Do you think council has addressed the risks appropriately? And that first question goes to Wendy. Thank you for that question. Yes, this is a, a great concern of mine. I'll, I'll use the Caton report in, as an example because it's had a dominant effect over the last couple of years. Uh, on how PO has been changing its operations. And I'm not going to say it's all negative. It's not all negative. But what you have is an external reviewer from a foreign country uh, reviewing our system and not having a vision, coming in and looking at it as a functional uh, system of, I'm going to say, a corporate board in effect or a nonprofit board, but not looking at any vision for the future not listening to members. There's many examples when that report was generated of members' perspective, not reaching council. There is huge filtering of that going on. So I do have concern when you have external uh, views coming in. We are a self-regulated body. We have enough members with 85,000. We should be able to solve our own problems internally, regulatory-wise. Thank you. Thank you. And the first response to that question goes to Darla. All right, so the question is about self-regulation and these, and these uh, outside reports that we receive. And I, I would say that I, I disagree with Royden's um, comments with respect to um, the, I actually believe it's important and actually it's, it's the responsibility of council to see outside uh, perspectives um, in order to, um, to gather that information to make informed decisions of how to move forward. So. Um, uh, an, an external report um, has value because it is from a third party, um, and that provides a perspective that is important. Um, um, and Royden's right that the that the 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 uh, person writing the report or the organization writing the report is not is not thinking about the future of the organization. They're just doing an, an analysis in the time. So it's a snapshot. I think I think council needs to take those reports seriously for the information and help to inform decisions, not necessarily to accept all the recommendations. So that's. Um, my response to that question. Thank you. And next response to Marilyn. Um, there is a myriad of reports that are demanding change at PEO. There is the Belanger, um, the Elliott Lake Inquiry recommendations. There is the uh, coroner's inquest and the death of Scott Johnson at the Radiohead stage collapse. There is the Harry Caton report that everybody keeps calling it. And I get a little upset when I hear that because it is actually the Williams Webb Caton report. There was two women who are very familiar with Canadian self-regulated professions that did the work. And, and so it wasn't done by an outsider. And I think as an organization, if we want to be high performing, we have to um, 
hear the feedback from outside organizations because we're here in the public interest. We're not here in our own self-interest. So I, I would suggest that we, we, but we need to PEOIs it. We just don't need to, you know, take recommendations, but we have to make it uh, fit uh, PEO in the public interest. Thank you. For the next question, I'm just going to, since we're all doing this from home, mentioning the response to COVID-19 pandemic. What challenges and opportunities are apparent from how PO operations responded to COVID-19 pandemic? And how should PO prepare for similar emergencies or disruptions in the future? That first one goes, the first response goes to Marilyn. Um, yes, I would say this is an operations issue, and I think it's very important that the board understand the division between operations and governance. Um, and I think there has been, having said that, uh, some some silver linings with COVID. It's, it's not been easy on any of us, um, but I would say that it's forced PEO to actually start a digital transformation. Uh, to think that we're engineers and we're supposed to be embracing technology, but yet we don't have online application systems. We didn't even have an online uh, C of A application until recently. Um, and so I think it's provided an opportunity for us to uh, pivot and um, adopt video conferencing technology. Uh, we were trying to do that before COVID hit and it just wasn't taken. Uh, so, so for me, there's been a lot of silver linings, um, but in terms of operations and staff volunteers and meeting, to me, those are the decisions of our CEO who has to follow public health guidelines. Thank you. First response to that question to, Ray, to Royden. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd just like to respond a little bit to the last question and say I'm not opposed to external critiques as a professor. I enjoy having these criticisms and working with them. It is a matter that the member input was ignored. And just to have external input and member input to be blocked was the problem with that particular report and these reports. It's a systemic. With regard to COVID, I agree with Marilyn. It's been an opportunity for change. There has been extremely poor implementations of that change where many members have been disenfranchised, disrespected, I'm gonna say, on committees, ignored. Uh, so it has not been a smooth transition at all. And I would add that even going digital, uh, there's still gonna be problems. The veracity problems with transcripts is not there now, whether they've gone digital. Uh, efficiencies are gone. So it's an opportunity, but problems. Thank you. Thank you. And Darla, your response. So I think PEO did a good job accelerating some of the digital solutions that were that they were already planning. And I think most organizations uh, worldwide needed to move forward a lot faster than maybe they had originally planned. Um, and I think that it brought these issues to the to the top of the list. So, um, for example, writing the PPE online is uh, is a great step forward. Um, there are more opportunities for sure to streamline operations um, and to move forward um, with the what we've learned through the pandemic. So I'll leave my response there. And staying on a theme of sort of strengths and weaknesses, next question to Darla. What weaknesses, if any, should the PO seek to improve in its role as a regulator or in its governance model? Uh, great question. So uh, it's important to for any organization to be aware of its uh, strengths and weaknesses and be able to take a look at um, ways to improve. So so there are opportunities in um, modernizing the um, the licensing process and accelerating the licensing process. Um, very very passionate that, uh, that there's there's room for improvement there and needs to be a priority. Um, there is a need for uh, 
uh, practice guidelines and standards uh, to be updated. Um, and as as uh, as president elect and president, um, I would put that as a top priority to to move forward to ensure that that there's progress made. Um, some of the standards have been have been looked at for a very long time, and that's a risk that we hold um, at PEO. So um, enhancing standards and practice guidelines and um, accelerating and modernizing the licensing. Thank you. Mm. Next response to Marilyn. Hi. Um, yeah, I, th I think um, there's a lot of um, positives about PEO and the fact that uh, we're all engaged engineers is, I think that's a positive. One of the weaknesses I see is that PEO did not adopt continuing professional development for many, many years. It's actually put our practitioners at risk uh, because we received a letter from Engineers Canada that we have been given a buy for, I think, a, a, a one year, um, but we um, uh, for a short period of time anyways, I'm not sure exactly the time. But PEO does not currently have mandatory requirement for continuing professional development of its registrants. So uh, we're putting at risk uh, um, the ability to join Engineers Canada Mobility Register to actually work in other provinces and outside of the country for international um, uh, work for engineers. And I find that a huge weakness, but that is hopefully being resolved by the current council. Thank you. Next response to Royden with respect to weaknesses the organization may need to There's absolutely not enough time here to uh, identify them all. I, I'll start with the MPP online national professional practice exam. Poorly implemented. Council did not ask the question, what do they want to measure first? I think they would have discovered that they don't just want rote memory. The devil can quote scripture. I won't go any further along that line, but there's interest I can. In terms of CPD that Marilyn mentioned, uh, uh, the, the threat of mobility in Canada is just not there. It's governments have a, a pact between them in Canada that we have the mobility. It, the governments would have to change, not Engineers Canada, we have to change the rules. And internationally, there's just no strong evidence that it's going to have a serious impact. I was involved with the work to try to get mobility with the US when we went from two to four years. Big threats there too. And what resulted? Nothing. So uh, that's a lot of smoke and mirrors. What needed was value added and relevancy in CPD and it wasn't there. Not enough time. The next two, Darla. I think I answered this question oh, right off the top. Excuse me, I was but jumping I'm happy to the next to take one. Another go at it for you. Give me another. <laughs> well, actually, we're. I would like. I, I. There was more than one question that came up um, online with respect to labor mobility, and so I'm going to summarize it and just let you jump through. I'm going to let you jump into this one. Um, the first one goes to um, Raiden. He was the last to respond to the last one. Um, do you believe there are any issues surrounding the mobility of licensing licensed engineers from Ontario? Certainly, there's mobility issues surrounding the licensed engineers from Ontario. Uh, there's mobility issues in terms of where do you want to move to? Do you want to move to other provinces? PNG moves automatically. So that's not an issue. That's just, that's in regulations and the government has passed that. We have no control over that. With regard to the U.S., sure, there's mobility issues. I, I know students that will go to the U.S. even under the Washington Accord. They have six um, complementary studies, but the state requires seven. So they have to take another course before they can even write the exams. So Yes, there's mobility problems. We never got our mobility with Michigan and Texas, and we spent a few years on trying to do that when we went from two to four years experience. Never happened. That's a mobility problem. So certainly they exist, but they are not a rationale for continuing professional development being mandatory. Thank you. Thank you. And the first response to that goes to Darla. 
So it's my understanding that uh, Engineers Canada has um, written to PEO Council, PEO, and, and, and Council has, has looked at this requirement that um, uh, PEO, because of its lack of, of um, continuing professional development having been implemented at that time, um, would begin to lose ground with respect to mobility, um, ease of mobility across the provinces. So um, there, there, there is a connection. Um, there is a connection there. Um, but, but more, more importantly, there, there are many um, other examples where Ontario is falling behind the great work that other regulators in Canada are are doing um, moving forward with. And I, I think it's um, it's it's something that uh, PEO needs to uh, pay attention to um, and needs to understand the risks associated with that and, and need to move forward with that. Thank you. Next response to Marilyn. Yeah. Um uh, I, wa I wanted to just say that I, as someone who works internationally, most of my projects are not in Canada. And, and the fact that can uh, PEO is Canada's largest engineering regulator, we should be leaders, not followers. Um, much of our engineering, uh, I, people have probably heard me say this, Toronto is the mining investment capital of the world. And the engineering firms that are located in the GTA most of the work they do is international. Um, so if we cannot export our engineers, we're losing economic opportunity. Um, and Darla was right. There is a uh, Engineers Canada letter uh, that we're putting uh, the mobility register and Engineers Canada inclusion in that at risk because PEO is not um, employing continuing professional development. I, um, I think, you know, we're aligned a bit, but it's how can you regulate your practitioners if you don't know what they're doing and how they're keeping themselves competent? Thank you. Oh, the time is flying. We might be able to squeeze two more in. Um, so the next question goes to Marilyn. Um, from, there's been a lot of talk about this, I've noticed in engineering dimension and so on. Uh, and here's the question. From a public protection standpoint, what, if any, value do you see in PO efforts to increase the rate of licensure of engineering graduate, Canadian or internationally trained? And again, that first goes to Maryland. Um, I actually, I actually don't see it as the role of the regulator to increase, um, you know, licensure within from engineering graduates, whether they're international or domestic. Um, to me, that's not our mandate. Um, it we do not advocate for engineering per se. We're not an advocacy body. The only advocacy role that PEO has is actually to communicate to the public what the role of the association is, I, th I think they also need to communicate to their members what their obligation is, um, their license holder. What, what, I think it's a huge gap that needs to be filled. Um, PEO does not actually communicate to our license holder what their obligation is to their own profession. Um, so I, you know, I, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. And then to Royden. Hey, Royden, yeah, I think you're on mute. There we go. I did it yesterday. It's all good. Thank you. Um, I think the regular has an enormous um, interest in the uh, rate of uptake of the professional engineering license. I will actually just uh, spin off a couple of things that Marilyn mentioned. The uh, whole thing about the CPD was supposed to be to monitor what's going on. I'm going to say the more members that we have, the more we know what's going on. There's much work going out there on the fringe, on the emerging disciplines, on the new technologies we don't know about. If we were a relevant regulator to that fringe and had those increased licensure, that would allow us to monitor what's going on and even maybe know what new disciplines to actually regulate, maybe even have demand side legislation on. It is a great metric for the success and relevancy of the profession. 75% of our members don't need to be licensed because they see value, but we need to have more value than that. We need the ethics, engineering ethics, 
more people following that. Thank you. Thank you. And to Darla. It's a little bit of passion on this one uh, for coming from Royden, and I and I share that. Um, I believe that everyone who graduates from an accredited engineering program should have a pathway to licensure, and it's important. Um, and and for international um, graduates who who meet the same the same uh, standards um, should have a pathway to licensure. It should be it should be easy. So PEO should not, as a regulator, be setting up. Um, uh, barriers uh, to make it difficult to to become part of the profession. Um, we're a stronger profession when we work together. And it helps to clarify from a public perspective the image um, and clarity of the professional engineers when, when those who have studied engineering choose to to become part of the profession. I think that will enhance uh, the public's trust um, in professional engineers. Thank you. Well, time flies. And this concludes the question portion of the meeting. And now each candidate will have two minutes for closing remarks, the order of which would be in the same order as the opening remarks. So the first ca candidate, Royden Fraser, your closing remarks. Thank you very much. As I said, there's a stark choice to be had here. And that choice is between a new vision for PO or the same old. Okay. I have seen council go through numerous governance changes, and that is not the solution. Governance is simply a tool that you use when it's appropriate to find your solutions. For me, PO should be focused on the big issues. The big issues, as I've mentioned, globalization, the emerging disciplines, entrepreneurs that don't get licensed and then say, what's the value in being licensed after their business takes off? And for them to be involved, we have to be relevant. And every decision PO makes, there should be value added, and they should be win-win value added. CBD is not a win-win, mandatory CPD. Mandatory CPD is a win-lose. Yes, there's the PR um, aspect to it. There's the public, you can say you're doing something. There's no evidence that actually the, the methods being used are effective for CPD monitoring. But then you have the added burden to those under the CPD program of having to complete those programs every year. And those hours are lots of money in terms of personnel time and member time. What I will do is try to generate a, a culture of relevancy, a culture of value added. Try to follow a vision of being a global leader in self-regulation, not a typical corporate model, which we seem to be on the route towards. We have knowledge-based decision-making that involves members and the highest level of transparency. That's what I would stand for as president. Thank you. Darla Campbell, your closing remarks. All right, thank you to Arthur Sinclair for moderating this session and to the team at PEO behind the scenes to make this event possible even in the time of COVID. I wanna thank uh, my uh, colleagues on the panel here, the, um, the competitors that um, are running also for president-elect. I wanna thank uh, all those candidates who put their names on the ballot for this election. It's, it's uh, important to have these discussions and it's important for PEO as, as, a, as a regulator. Um, this campaign is about leadership, vision and results. And and relevance in a fast-changing world is a key and important. Um, I'm passionate about that. Um, there's two sides to this. One is the need to have a pathway for licensure for each graduate from an accredited engineering program. And two is to accommodate the changing roles throughout our professional career. And to regulate only the traditional disciplines is missing the gaps in fast-paced innovation and, te and technology. The emerging discipline of yesterday is likely to morph into something else along the career path, and we need to support professional engineers throughout their career and be able to accommodate changes um, in, spe in specialization and into management. Um, I want to thank those of uh, you who are watching today, and thank you for listening. Um, if you voted last year, please vote again this year. If you didn't vote last year, this is your chance to vote. Um, reach out to your fellow PNGs and invite them to vote as well. The future of the profession is in your hands. 
in your day-to-day -day work, in your voice, and in your vote. I ask for your support to bring my energy, collaborative leadership, and commitment to elevate the engineering profession in Ontario and build the value of professional engineers. Vote Darla Campbell for president-elect. We are building the future together. Marilyn Spink, your closing remarks. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody for giving up their time. We're, none of us are paid to do this, <laughs> so thank you. Um, I wanted to just uh, agree with actually Royden. PEO is on a path to irrelevance, and so change is needed. You can't ask for change without changing anything. And council has made some significant change in the last few years. And I think I'm one of the longest serving members on council that has that corporate history. Uh, so decisions that we made three years ago don't need to necessarily be revisited. And what I've seen as a pattern on council is that we change our chair every year after five, four or five council meetings. And they just sort of get in the groove and then they're out. What high-performing organization does that? I think that's one of our systemic problems and why governance change has finally taken hold. Um, I cherish self-regulation, and I really think that we don't communicate to our practitioners why they should, um, because I wouldn't want the government uh, to regulate us. And so I think this is a privilege, not a right, but we need to do it within the public interest. And that's not just safety. It's economic, health, welfare, the environment. Um, and I think there's quite a bit of work that we can be doing there. PEO is on a tremendous transformational journey. We are halfway through it and we need to continue that. And so I hope I have your support to vote for me, Marilyn Spink, as your president-elect to can keep us on this transformational change journey. Now this concludes tonight's discussion. I would like to thank the candidates for their participation and also to those watching online for their interest in the governance of the engineering profession. I hope you, will, hope you found the meeting to be informative and worthwhile. As a reminder, the recording of this meeting will be on PEO's website for the duration of this election. Thank you again to everyone for participating in our discussion. And remember, your profession matters. So does your vote. Voting is quick and easy. You can vote on the internet or by phone. Voting opens on January 14th and closes at 4 p.m. on February 18th. All the information you need is on the PEO's website. That is www.peo.on.ca. Please stay tuned following this broadcast for a presentation on the roles and responsibilities of PEO Council. Good night. Professional Engineers Ontario was created by law and its mandate is set out in the Professional Engineers Act. PEO's job is to establish standards, to license qualified people and organizations, and to ensure that people comply with the standards. These are the rules needed to keep people and the environment safe. The engineered world is more complex, more interconnected, and more dependent on technology every day. And the engineering profession continues to evolve to help shape the world we want to see. And just as the profession grows more complex, so does its regulation. PEO is led by a board of directors called a council, and the quality of PEO as a regulator depends on having the right people on council. Council is a mix of elected engineers and individuals appointed by the government, and it has two jobs to provide direction about how to best achieve the public protection mandate and, at a high level, to oversee PEO's overall performance to ensure the work is carried out effectively and efficiently. Councillors work together to develop PEO's strategic plan and to assess achievement of the plan. Council allocates resources by setting broad budget priorities and ensures an adequate budget is available to achieve the goals. Council establishes and reviews policies, position statements, guidelines and bylaws. It considers and recommends changes to legislation that are necessary for PEO to continue to meet its mandate. And, last but not least, PEO's council must monitor its own performance to make sure that it is as effective and efficient in its decision-making as it can be. 
Being on PEO Council is a big commitment and a specialized role. Council work requires a minimum of 12 days per year, and councillors are also required to sit on a governance committee, adding at least six more days of work. Councillors come to PEO to serve the people of Ontario. It's a lot of work, and it's not for everyone. But strong self-regulation is one more way that professional engineers ensure that the people of Ontario receive safe and effective engineering services. Whether you're thinking of running for election or trying to decide who to vote for, visit peovote.ca for more information.